Hello and welcome. I'm sitting here today with Bates Gill and Linda Jacobson prior to their presentation to the AAA New South Wales about uh, the book that they've co-edited, co-authored, China Matters. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to discuss uh, a little bit what's occurred this week um, with North Korea firing a couple of missiles over Japan. Um, I guess Bates, given your expertise with Japan in particular, what sort of response may we expect from Japan and, uh, and the neighbours of North Korea? Well, I don't think we'll see Japan taking any sort of unilateral action, but I think they're going to be putting a lot of pressure on Washington and their other partners in the region like South Korea and even China uh, to step up and uh, deliver a very, very powerful message back. This is highly provocative, deliberately targeting uh, Japan. And what's interesting about this, I think, is, is, is the calculation which North Korea is making uh, by sort of targeting Japan in this way. It, it sows doubt, it sows potential discord and, and, and dissension and division into the U.S.-Japan alliance. And in a way, given the sort of ill will that uh, is still there in the region, especially in China and in South Korea, uh, by targeting Japan in this way, um, you know, uh, it, it's sort of in a, in a way, uh, there will be some in China and in South Korea who actually will be smiling in a way uh, because it's uh, um, in, in the way that it is, is, is sort of singling out Japan for this sort of provocative act. And today uh, we've had Malcolm Temple come out and um, talk of the response that perhaps China or the, the weight that China can bring to bear on North Korea um, to prevent further action. Um, Linda, perhaps if you could talk to you know what um, what weight China does have and what response we might um, see from China. I think every time North Korea makes a provocative move, we all wait and expect China to do more, to weigh in, um, to really put genuine pressure on North Korea um, to to stop the provocative actions, but also to dismantle the nuclear program. Um, I think we're getting closer and closer to the point where we will see a rather harsh response from China. I think China is also getting impatient. One should never forget that China does not want to nuclearize North Korea. This is not in China's interests. But on the other hand, China is very hesitant to put too much pressure on North Korea because it doesn't want North Korea to collapse either. Um, but I think we are getting closer to that point where we'll see a rather robust response um, from China. So what form could that robust response take? Well, China has um, quite a few tools. It can cut off um, North Korea's food um, exports, um, also to a certain degree the food aid they could cut off. They could cut off some of the energy um, flows to North Korea. So they're the one country which does wield quite a large stick when it comes to North Korea. Um, on the other hand, will these even work, even if they did wield that big stick? Um, it's, it's really a question. One of the measures I think that the Washington would surely like to see China do is uh, prevent its banks from um, basically being the conduit point through which uh, North Korea continues to engage the international community economically. Um, it's, it's a, that's primarily done through processes and channels of, of the Chinese banking system. Um, and if those were fully, fully cut off, that would be a pretty big blow uh, to North Korea. And has Beijing given it any, any uh, sort of indication that it might use that? Uh, well, um, you know, most recently Washington uh, um, threatened to impose so-called secondary sanctions, so in other words, U.S. sanctions against Chinese banks because they felt that the Chinese were not doing enough to deal with their own banks. Um, so they could do a lot more, uh, the Chinese could in that area, but as Linda says, uh, a little bit of hesitation there because they don't want a precipitous and chaotic collapse of North Korea. I don't think anyone does, really. Um, I guess, um, sort of moving back to China matters, um, you uh, established three principles within the book uh, by which Australia can sort of perhaps uh, manage and judge its relationship with China. And those principles are, was it uh, principles, prosperity, or those, those um, the basis is principles, prosperity, and security. And obviously we've discussed security a little bit now. Um, Linda, perhaps you could talk to those other two principles by which we can judge or, or manage our relationship with China. Well, certainly I think Australia will always be challenged on the, on the um, measure of principles 
uh, when dealing with the People's Republic of China. It is a one-party authoritarian state. Um, certainly many Australian values um, are not ones that um, are upheld in the People's Republic of China. So on the question of principles, there's always going to be um, a level of tension, um, and it's something that we discuss in our book. I think when it comes to really core values of Australian society, Australia needs to st stand up for itself um, and push back if it feels in some way threatened um, in the relationship by the People's Republic of China. I'm specifically referring to the increasing influence of the PRC government in Australian society. And we've seen now that this tension is rising and obviously we're going to see more influence um, as China becomes more important. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess um, to do with prosperity, and there's a lot of discussion in uh, Australian media about the prosperity factor, I mean, I guess recently the uh, Chinese government um, put further oversight on the in foreign investment by state-owned oper operators or enterprises, sorry. Um, I guess what, what impact might we see um, from that within Australia? Well, on this specific question of um, foreign investment and specifically um, investment from the People's Republic of China, I think um, as we move forward, Australia is going to be able to manage that um, more effectively. I think um, the, the increase of investment took Australians a bit by surprise. Um, Australia didn't have the processes in place. I know that now, for example, the Attorney General's Department has established a critical infrastructure unit. They're looking at the processes very carefully so that um, when there are issues of national security, um, these will be um, evaluated um, in good time so that a Chinese investor is told in good time that not worth thinking about investing. This is something that we're not going to sell to any foreigners. Um, so I don't see that as really a critical uh, point of tension. There'll be the uproars um, as they have been. Um, moving forward, I think we need to keep in mind that the relationship is extremely important for Australia. I like to say that Australian prosperity really depends on um, managing a good relationship with the People's Republic of China. It's going to get all the more difficult, but the complementarity between the two economies um, is such that um, we have no other choice than to keep working at it. And I guess finally, um, thank you very much for joining me. Um, Bates, do you see any challenges in the immediate future um, in the Australia-China relationship? Well, I think it will be interesting to see how the debate unfolds in this country as to foreign investment generally uh, and, and the degree to which China uh, ends up sort of being a scapegoat uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of the concerns in society, especially around real estate prices and the like. Um, so that could go in the wrong direction, I suppose. I'm also interested to see, you know, how can Australia take, and, it, and its firms in particular, uh, take greater advantage of the opportunities presented by the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, I think Australia's been a bit slow off the blocks in, in trying to f plug into that a little bit more effectively um, for different economic and political reasons. And then I suppose um, there's always the, I mean we haven't mentioned it yet, there's always the possibility uh, at some point that the tensions really begin to heat up between the United States and China over whether it's the Korean Peninsula or possibly even in the South China Sea, uh, in which case uh, you know, that's going to create some very, very hard choices uh, in Australia as to you know, how much they wish to back uh, the Americans in that sort of a, of a contestation um, and risk you know, the, 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 the constructive and productive relationship that they've built with China. Yes, and that's an ongoing discussion. Um, thank you very much again for your time. Um, thank you for joining us. And if you would like any more information about international affairs, please go to the internationalaffairs.org.au website or follow us on uh, Facebook or Twitter. Thanks again.